Uh, today we're finishing up our series on pressure. Everybody say pressure. pressure. Come on, you can do better than I say pressure. pressure. All right, so let's review for a little bit. If you haven't been with us all three weeks up until this point, now our fourth week, we started this whole series um, with the first week of pressure at work and the difficulties that you and I face uh, in our job, whether we stay at home mom or dad or whether we, we, uh, we work, uh, you know, with our hands or whether we work in, in uh, a, 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 you know, teaching or whatever it may be and the pressures that happen there. And that first week we talked about how we need to ask the Lord for help in our jobs, that we don't need to just try to go out and, and figure it out in, in worldly type of ways, but let's get God's principles at work and let's go back and do what we saw Daniel did in the book of Daniel as he actually incorporated God's laws, his ways into his business. And as a result, God promoted him and advanced him and he walked in peace in the midst of great trial and tribulation. And then we talked about the next week, the pressure at home and the pressure that, uh, that, that it's a result of being married and having kids and having roommates and just the pressure at home. And, and we identified the top three pressures in the home life uh, being number one, money, number two, communication, and number three, uh, busyness. And I, I challenge you on some practical things. The part of the money issue of the pressure that you're feeling at home could be that you're spending more than you should be spending. You, you're trying to get things that you don't really need and I, I challenge you to work on a budget and, and kind of bring some of that pressure down by not trying to keep up with the Joneses, as they used to say back in the day. And then the second area we talked about was the communication. And we said that, man, home needs to be safe. Uh, your house needs to be a place of safety. Uh, you, we shouldn't be cussing and spitting and fighting there. And that should be a place where we take care of one another and watch out for one another. And really challenge you on some practical ways to work on your communication in the home. And then the last, being busy. And as your pastor, I just, I just set you free. I, I just release you. I said, listen, I want to release you as your pastor. You don't have to go to every birthday party for every niece, nephew, cousins, cousins, niece, and nephew. And every person at work and their kids. And all the busyness is cr creating some of the pressure that you can literally walk in a little bit more wisdom. Them, and you don't have to be at everything. And everybody said amen to that one. And then last week, we were talking about the ducks of life, the DUCs, the difficult, unexpected circumstances. And we were talking about how those happen, and we identified a couple things. Number one, there it's inevitable. Difficulty is going to come to us. It's just life. And uh, But if we hold to Christ... And he is the center of our world instead of us trying to be the center of his world and, 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 excuse me, the center of our world and bringing him into our world. Instead, making him the center of our world that when difficult things happen, he then is in control and in charge and we can have peace in the midst of the difficult circumstances. And we challenged us that we would remember to rely on him through every peace and that also that we would walk in the supernatural authority that God has placed on our life. Well, as you look at those three, last three pieces in this series, they, they all had to do with things that were happening to us and the pressure and how God can help us overcome that pressure and how God can help us through those pressures. But today is a little different in that we close out the series with the pressure that literally is pressure from God or of God or because of God's plans. And I would say it like that there are pressures that are actually the result of God's plan for your life. That God literally has such a beautiful plan for each and every one of you that that in and of itself creates a pressure. That because God God has a plan to promote you and to exalt you and to use you at greater levels than you're being used at now. Because God has a, a purpose and a, and a desire for you to, to, to be a, 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 a child of the king, reigning and ruling on this earth and, 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 and walking in righteousness. Because he has such a plan for that, that in and of itself creates pressure. And, and, and some would even say it like this, and, 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 and you've got to be careful in how you say it, but, but because of some of those things, you could almost say that God allows those pressures in our life or even causes some of those pressures to happen. And the reason that is, is because he's got a plan to propel you, to, to move you forward, to, to get you from here to there. And you and I must understand and grasp the concept that pressure, that, that difficulties literally are the fuel that propels. And so as, you, as we go into this teaching today, I believe it'll help you, especially in embracing that not everything that you don't like about your life is literally the devil. That not everything is your friend's fault or your spouse's fault or, you know, because you made bad decisions over the years. Some of the things that are happening God is using them to propel you to greatness, to develop in you who he wants you to be. And so we've got a key passage here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17 and 18. Look at that one on the screen. This is a good one to memorize. This is a good one to mark in your Bible for the years to come of your life. I hold to this on a daily basis. And it says it like this, for our light 
and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Do you see how this passage says it? These light and momentary troubles. Now, none of us, when we're in the middle of a trouble, calls it light or momentary. I mean, when we're in it, it ain't light, or we wouldn't call it trouble. It wouldn't be difficulty. If, if it was light to us, it wouldn't be difficult. But I love the way the scripture lays it out, almost tongue-in-cheek. These light and difficulties, these, they're, just, they're just for a moment. And guess what they're doing? And this is the key piece of this whole passage. They are achieving for us an eternal glory. They are achieving for us something that is glorious and that will last for eternity. Are you with me? Say yes. So these light momentary troubles, when you and I are going through some of these things, what you need to understand is they are light and they are momentary, but they will achieve for us something that is eternal. Listen, I don't know about you, but I want to look like Jesus, act like Jesus, uh, do what Jesus did. I want to heal the sick, raise the dead. I want to overcome the things of this world just like my Jesus did. And friend, when us to overcome something, we got to go uh, through something. For us to be a overcomer, we have to have stepped over something. There had to be a trial or a tribulation or a difficulty. And these things, these light momentary troubles are producing for us. They are achieving for us an eternal glory. Somebody ought to say amen. An eternal glory. Something bigger than you and bigger than me is happening within us because God is at work because he loves us so much. Isn't that good? Say yes. And so let's look at a couple of life examples in the Holy Scriptures. And I want to start with the story of Joseph. Now, Joseph, uh, if you'll turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 37, it, th the pieces that I want to cover span over about a four or five chapter uh, space, so I can't read all the whole passages, and aren't you glad? Say amen. You thought, my God, this service is turned, and I know he was long-winded, but we just, he's going to read seven chapters. But we're just going to kind of skip around, and I'll bring out the highlights pieces of it. And so Joseph is this young man who is greatly loved by his dad. In fact... He is one of the youngest of all his, his dad's sons. And uh, in fact, he, you know, his mom is different than some of the other moms because in those days, you know, they married, uh, they had uh, multiple wives and things like that. And so, so Joseph is his dad's favorite, so much so that his dad gives him a multicolored uh, coat, uh, the coat of many colors that you may have learned in vacation Bible school back long ago or a song from the 60s. But he had this multicolored jacket that made him stick out from everybody else. In other words, when he walked, in the room, you knew he was from money. When he walked in, you knew like, dang, come on, bro, you really, you wearing the multicolored jacket today again? Because it's warm, 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 warm. I mean, there's no getting away from it. If that wasn't enough, that his dad had special attention for him, loved him more than his other boys, then what happens is this young kid starts having dreams, and he starts seeing visions from God. And so let's pick up in verse 5 of chapter 37 of the book of Genesis. It'll be on the screen. Chapter Chapter 37 and verse 5, and it says, And Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. Everybody say, hated him. Hated. And say it all the more. I don't know how much they hated him before, but they hated him all the more. And so he has this dream, and he goes to tell it to him. And he says in verse 6, he says, listen to the dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in a field when suddenly my sheep rose and stood upright while your sheep gathered around mine and bowed down to it. He's the little brother. Most of these guys are grown and already are starting families. They already have multiple parts of the family business that they're running. Dad's gotten old. Dad's picked out this little sucker to be his favorite all of a sudden. Bought him a little, you know, a little, you know, effeminate colored coat. I mean, he's got him, you know, he's got all this little thing going. And, and they already don't like this sucker. And now he's going to say, God gave him a dream. Let me tell you about it. It's awesome. In my dream, you all bowed down in front of me. And I was the man. I'm the ruler. And then verse 8, and his brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? Now, I, I, it's, when you read text, it's hard to get the real inflections that are happening here, but I see veins popping out of their, out of their neck. I see steam coming off their head as they say this. And they hated him all the more. Boy, this all the more hatred is just building right here. And it says, and, and he goes, in verse 9, then he had another dream. And he told him again. 
this kid's not only is he anointed, but he's stupid. I mean, he's having these dreams from God, and he goes and, and he goes and tells him. He goes, listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars were all bowing down to me. <laughs> Not just you, but also mom and dad. Everybody was bowing down to me. Because I'm the man. I was in charge. I was the ruler. I was awesome. And so even more, the hatred built. Days, weeks, whatever it is later, dad sends him out to check on the brothers who were way out doing business out in fields. You know, they were, you know, agrarian culture, you know, working with sheep and, and camels and whatever else, fields of grain and whatever else they were doing. And as they saw him a long distance, all the brothers saw him and the hatred begins to stir in them. And they say, here comes that dreamer. And they decided we're going to kill him. We're going to kill him, and we'll tell dad that some animal or something must have killed him, and we're going to, because we hate him so much. But he had one brother that loved him and, said, and ta talked him out of killing him, and instead they took him, stripped him down, beat him down, and threw him down in a well, or a cistern, as the Bible calls it. Throws him down in the cistern. And as he's down in the cistern, can you imagine? He's just a junior high age. He's that, you remember when they, you, anybody got a junior high kid right now? Anybody got fourth, fifth grader? Who know everything? He's that kid. Hey, yo, let me out of here. It's cold down here. It's dark. Guys, okay, the joke is over. Y'all not really going to kill me because remember, you have to bow down to me. <laughs> Big dummy. And all the more angry and angry. They're just getting, and they're desired, they're going to kill him. And th that's their whole plan. And the brother had, at least talks him into throwing him down into the well. And let's pick up right there in Genesis chapter 37, verse 28. It says, and then what they saw was a group of Midian uh, selling uh, uh, folks. Uh, 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 how do they call them here? Midian merchants doing this big march to Egypt. And they realized, hey, let's sell him to them. And so in verse 28 of Genesis chapter 37, it says, And when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver. Does that 20 shekels, shekels of silver ring a bell to any of you in the room? Sold him for 20 sec shekels, I can't even say it right, shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. Now that sounds really neat when you read it on, in a Bible and doesn't really have a real impact for you, just reading words on a page. But let me, can, can, you, can you put this uh, just for a moment in perspective? Imagine you being a junior high kid and you say, well, I didn't have brothers and sisters. Imagine you did. And imagine wherever you lived in, you know, wherever you grew up in Arlington or some other part of the nation or something. And you made them so mad that they literally, they know the guy who's doing the sex trafficking and doing the, and doing the uh, you know, the, the slavery stuff. And they literally have you kidnapped. They get paid for it. You end up in a black tinted out van and next thing you know you're on a ship down in the bottom of a ship somewhere and you, live, you end up in some god forsaken part of the world that you don't even know or ever heard. Can you imagine this kid's, can you imagine the emotional state that he's going through? Can you imagine the, not just the rejection but their hatred being expelled upon him or being put upon him and the fear and the intrepidation as now he's being, he's being, he's being tied up, gagged and he's in this caravan as a kid going to Egypt, a place, a land that he doesn't know, a language he does not speak. He's just a kid. And this is what's transpiring. Can you imagine as he's crying and weeping, his dad, he'll never see his dad again. There is no favor. He went from being the favored child to now he's en route in slavery. And the Bible says that when he gets to Egypt, they sell him to Potiphar. And Potiphar, is a, he's a military personnel, and he's, got, he's very influential. He's got good money. He's pretty wealthy. He's got multiple slaves and servants and a lot of operations of a big house and all the workings of his house. And he takes Joseph on. And now Joseph doesn't know the language, is learning the language. Now, he's a slave now. He went from being a value to being a human with human rights to now he's a slave. He, he has no rights. In fact, you see many times in history how slaves were treated, and especially when you look back into the biblical times, especially in those times where they literally would rape those people, they would treat those people as property, they would treat them as worthless, they would do whatever they wanted to those people because they didn't see them as people, they saw them as animals like you would a horse or a dog or a property uh, that you have that it, it, it has no real life to it. That's how they saw them. 
And so Joseph is now in that. But oh, but God is gracious to him in the midst of that. Now, he's got a prophecy, he's got a word from the Lord that everyone's going to bow down at him, that he's going to be exalted up. But he's not being exalted at this stage of his life. In fact, this is the dark, most horrible moment of his life. But God, in the midst of that darkness, in the midst of his pain, in the midst of all the difficulty, he begins to promote him. And before you know it, Potiphar begins to trust Joseph, and he begins to make him over all of his stuff. I mean, he starts with overseeing the sheep, and he does so well with that, and then he lets him oversee the sheep and all the camels and it does well with that so all the produce that they're growing and then not only that then start overseeing his finances and then it just expands to the place where Potiphar trusts him with everything the whole operations of his family business of his life of his comings and goings at his home even to the place of trusting him with his wife now let's look in chapter 39 verse 6 and 7 it says and now Joseph was well built and handsome. What happened was, in all of these years of being a little slave boy for Potiphar, Joseph grew up. And all of a sudden now, little Joseph, he got abs. All of a sudden, Joseph's got some, some pecs that are bouncing up and down when he flexes, picking up stuff. And he's got that Hebrew skin color. He's got that dark. Arabian night skin color thing going. Hmm? He's got the favor of God on him, even though he's a slave. Man, he's looking good. And so I'm just telling you what the Bible says. I'm just saying the Bible right there. Verse 6, he was well built and he's handsome. Now, the Bible doesn't lie. Look, if you're ugly, the Bible calls you ugly. And so he, he's, <laughs> he's well built and handsome. In verse 7, and after a while, everybody say after a while. After a while, his master's wife took notice of Jodas, Joseph. He's out there, you know, he's out there working in the yard, you know. He's working with the weed eater. <laughs> and she's, she's washing dishes and looking out the window like, hey. And Joseph, you know, he's over there and he's trying to get, rinse all the sweat, the water all over him. And she's like, <laughs> I'm just telling you the Bible. I'm sorry. I'm just being honest with the Word of God. It says, and after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. And it has an exclamation mark. So <clears throat> obviously she was very passionate about it. And for you guys that under, understand how gracious the scripture are not to come across uh, too perverted, uh, basically she's saying, come have sex with me. And uh, if you'll keep reading, uh, he says to her, he goes, I can't do that. He goes, listen, uh, you're, you're, my master, your husband has entrusted me with everything, including you. And, uh, and I don't, I don't want to mess with that. I'm not going to, no, I'm so sorry I can't do that. And so here she is trying to make moves on him. And she's like, oh, come on. Yeah, come on. You know you want to. And she's doing that whole thing that Satan does and temptation that happens to all of us. And so, or some of us. And so, and so, you know, weeks, months, whatever goes by. And the story continues on that he goes inside to take care of something in the, in the house. And she calls him into her bedroom. And she basically <laughs> jumps him and, uh, and, and, and says, lie with me right now. Sleep with me right now. And the Bible says that Joseph just takes, pushes her off and takes off running. Well, as he's running away, she's grabbing at him. I'm talking about a cougar, man. She's grabbing at this guy, and she gets his coat off of him, his outer gar gar garment, kind of shirt, little robe-looking thingy thingy. And because he runs out in his underwear, you know, can you see, does it call in the streak? And he's running down outside, you know, to his little, little place that he stays at the bottom of the hill. And, uh, and, and, and she's so angry and so mad. And so embarrassed that she makes up a lie that he tried to rape her. And so she waits for Potiphar to get home. She's laying in her bed, clutching the garment. And when he comes in, what's the matter? What's the matter? That Hebrew man, he's not a boy anymore if you haven't noticed. He tried to rape me. And when I screamed out, he fled. But I wasn't letting him get away. I grabbed a hold of his jacket. Look, here it is. Here's his cloak. And in a rage, Potiphar goes and he puts, he, it's, a, it's a miracle he didn't kill him. And he puts him in jail. And so here's Joseph. Hadn't done anything wrong. All he did was get a prophetic word from God. All he did was be a junior high kid. All he did was, all he did was just, just, just 
just talk too much is the most that he, you could blame this kid for. And here he is now, not only in slavery, but now he's being thrown into prison. And now he's thrown into prison. We don't know if he's there, you know, five, six, seven years, whatever it was. But now he's, now he's fulfilling his growing up years in prison. And can you imagine, now we're not talking about prison like we have where they get three square meals a day and they can watch cable or whatever they can do. Or different. I know that's not really true, but anyway, my point is we're talking about the scum parts of the city. They would literally, they would dig them out. They would have caves and things like that and jail pieces. And literally, most of the times, the sewer of the cities would run down through the middle of it because it was down in the crevice areas of a city, a real place where, where no one wanted to live. And most of the guys died of disease, just contracting disease in these type of environments. And in the midst of that, God blesses Joseph again. In fact, he gets to the place that he's on the, you know, he's on the inmate work program, and the jailer begins to trust him so much, man, just oversee everything. Here's the keys, just don't escape, okay? Okay. And so Joseph ends up running the jail. He's running the jail. And after years and years of running the jail, the king of Egypt, the Pharaoh of Egypt, has a conflict. He has some type of problem with his baker and his cupbearer, the guy who drinks everything and eats everything so it doesn't kill the king to taste it. And he throws them both in jail. And one night as they're in jail, they both have dreams. And, they're, and, and they know it's a serious dream. It's, they're marked by it. And they ask, and Joseph comes by and he sees them. He says, what's bothering you guys? And they said, we had dreams. And he goes, well, tell it to me. And they tell it to him. And he says, well, this is what God says. And he has a prophetic uh, interpretation of those dreams. And basically, the interpretation is one of you going to die, which is the baker, and, uh, and, and, and the king's going to, he's going to kill you, and another one of you in three days, you're going to be exalted back to the king's side, and he goes, and that's going to be the cupbearer, and he goes, and he tells him, and when that happens, remember me, because this is not fair that I've been put in here. This is unjust. I didn't do anything to deserve this. And just remember me as, a, as, as what I'm telling you, this prophetic word I'm giving you comes true, remember me. And he goes, oh yeah, of course. It happened exactly like he prophesied. Just like he saw it, it came to pass just that way. And so the cupbearer, but the Bible says that for two years the cupbearer forgot about him. So let's pick up right there in and, uh, and, and Genesis chapter 39. And uh, let's see, I'm going to skip all the way down to ver chapter 41 actually. And it says, uh, when, uh, it says, and when two full years, verse 1, Pharaoh has a dream. When two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream. So David's been forgotten about for two years, and then Pharaoh has a dream. And in his dream, he sees these things happening. And no one can figure out what his dream is about. No one can give him an understanding that makes sense to him. And one day, as he's distraught by this, his cupbearer says, King, I forgot to tell you, two years ago, I met this little Hebrew kid. I mean, he's been in jail a long time. And, uh, and he said he, he was kidnapped and basically whatever, but... He actually prophesied to me about my dream that I had that this would happen, and here I am. And the Pharaoh said, go get him. And he brings him out, shaves him, cleans him up. And now Joseph is standing in front of the Pharaoh of Egypt. And you have to understand, Egypt at this time is the most powerful nation on the planet. They have conquered just about everyone. They are the, this is the most powerful man, and Joseph is standing in front of him. And in that moment, Joseph, the, Pharaoh looks at him and says, I hear you interpret dreams. And he says, no, sir, but my God does. He'll tell you what is going on. And so he tells him the dream. He gives him a prophetic utterance. And in that moment, it all turns. And I want to kind of illustrate this for just a moment. And, you know, I think about Joseph's life. And, uh, you know, I like to mess with Plato. And I think about when he was that kid and he got that dream. And I want this Plato to kind of represent. So he has this wonderful, joyous experience. And, he, and, he, and he's favored, man. And it's light. Everything about his life is just so cool and perfect. And it's bright and exciting. His future's so bright, he's got to wear shades. 80s reference. And so, and so you know, it, it, that, it's kind of what it looks like. And, and, then, and then what happens is his brothers start hating him. He doesn't really even know why. He's just being a kid. And his brothers start hating him. And, and so what is bright and exciting kind of gets mixed in with some other tough things in life, you know, and that his brothers don't like him, but, you know, it's okay. Dad loves him, and, and, and it's going to be okay. And, 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 and then as we learned already in the story, as, as Joseph's life, you know, it was bright, and, and maybe not as bright as it was uh, now that he's a little older and his brothers are hating on him and, and so forth and so on, but he didn't expect it to change the color that it did. And in one moment, they threw him down in the darkness. In one moment, they threw his life away. 
One moment, everything that was a dream and everything that was excitable and everything that was planned, everything that he thought God had for him, all of a sudden it shifts and it's gone. It's been how some of your lives were. Some of you remember when you were a kid and you were the, you were the life of the party. And now you, you, now you walk in depression. You're always fighting it. You're scared to interact with people. Some of you, some of your life has dealt you so many bad blows and difficulties have, have so kind of tried to take over your life that you used to be bright and excitable and, and used to enjoy life and now it's everything you can do just to even come to church and try to interact with us as believers and you love God the best you can, but the whole color scheme of your life has started to change and, or it started to change in those days. And, 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 it's, and it's life dealt you more and more circumstances and more and more difficulties have happened and, and, you, and you ended up in a divorce and you never had planned that and, and you went to Bible school school and you thought it would have turned into a ministry moment like you like like the like the dream that you had and, and now you're finding yourself and you're selling cars or something like that and you're like where is God in all of this and it's it's though life has gotten has so many difficulties that it's gotten dark and dreary and and hard and that's kind of what happened to Joseph and so what was beautiful and full of life I, I guarantee there wasn't a night that he didn't go to sleep crying I guarantee it there wasn't a night as he was traveling it didn't take him days to get to it probably took him weeks to get into Egypt I mean, it took him a long journey, excuse me, and, and he cried himself to sleep as a junior. Can you imagine the insecurity? Can you imagine the hatred of his own heart that his brothers would do this? And yet he had to keep trying to rely on his God. He had to keep trying to cultivate what God was doing inside of him. I imagine that many times he thought that dream will never happen. I would imagine as the darkness began to encapsulate all the little light and dreams of his life. And one layer after another, it got darker and darker and darker and darker until he was sitting there in prison. Can you imagine? Two years that, 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 that he sat there after he'd given uh, these guys, uh, you know, gave this guy the prophetic word. And, 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 and I guarantee he'd given up all hope. And he's sitting there in the darkest moment. Now his life looks much more like this dark difficult thing. The dreams of God seem so far away. They seem so far distant that God would, would, God would allow these things to happen. And, and there's a lot of doctrine on these things. People will say, you know, well, God doesn't let bad things happen. And friend, I would say to you like this, that in the bad things, God can be in the midst. I would say to you that God's plan for you will create difficulty and pressure that you never thought would happen. And that if you're not careful, you'll misjudge the pressure, the difficulty that you're in and bind the devil and say it's not right. Or you'll turn on God and say, why is God allowed? this to happen to me. Friend, can I tell you, when God has a plan for you, pressure is a part of the process. When God has a dream for you and something you, there is darkness that's going to be a part of that thing. There's hardship and hardness and what might have been so soft and tender when you were a kid and now you do, every prophecy you're like, I don't even know if I believe in prophecy anymore. I've been there. And, 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 and every time, you know, every time you feel like you're getting four steps forward, you're taking six steps backwards. And that's, and that's probably where Joseph found himself. But friend, I want you to know that in the midst of all that that happened over the years, all the difficulty and all the shamefulness and all the misappropriation of who he was, all those things that had just come a part of his life. I mean, listen, the guy knows, he, he speaks Egyptian now. In fact, when his brothers finally do show up years later, when they finally do show up, they don't even recognize him because he doesn't look like a Hebrew boy anymore. He looks Egyptian. He smell, he's, not as, he's not as holy as he was when he first started. He's got the taint of the world on him because he's lived in it. He knows what it is to be incarcerated. He knows what it is to do what you got to do to live through it. He's been encompassed with these things for years. And they literally, they, they, they've encompassed him and, and made up who he is. And, and, and he doesn't even know, is there even life down in the midst of him anymore? Is there even a dream from God? I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine that he had a hope in that moment where the one, where the one cupbearer said, yeah, I won't forget you. When they came to get the cupbearer, can you imagine what Joseph was thinking? This is it. This is it. This is it. And I, finally, God's going to take something and bless me. Finally, my, all the difficulties of my life are coming to an end. Finally, all the pain and the suffering that I've been through, that's going to come to an end, and I'm going to be promoted, and then it didn't happen again. Can you imagine being in Potiphar's house and you're finally, you're finally getting somewhere? You're finally not the one that's begging for the crumbs, but you're actually the guy in charge of the food. Can you imagine? And then when that moment happens where the where the Potiphar's wife begins to just go and attack you, and down in there somewhere, all you're finding is the blackness and the darkness. But if you'll keep just hammering away, I'm telling you, if you'll just keep looking down what God has been doing, because God's been doing something down in you this whole time. You say, oh, Pastor Adam, I used to be so on fire for God. I used to pray. 
pray for people and they used to get healed and now everyone's having to pray for me I used to do marriage teachings and help people stay married but since I've been through a divorce I don't even think God can ever use me again and what you did was you didn't realize that all of that that was happening all those layers all those pieces that have broken your heart I'm gonna get to the middle of this at some point by the way <laughs> all those pieces that are I'm trying not to oh that hurt I'm trying not to uh, break my my little table here but down on the inside of that what you didn't realize was happening was God was putting in you something so deep and so beautiful. What was our key scripture? For these momentary light afflictions are producing for us. They're literally creating in us. I've got to get this open here. Give me a second. Uh, they're producing for us something that far outweighs everything else. Let me see if I can get it crap. Oh, there we go. Oh, almost. All right, we've got to hit it from the other side. Y'all still with me? Don't give up on me. You still love me? All right, let me get down through the middle of this one. This one was a little harder. There we go. Mm, mm, mm. What's on the inside, Pastor? You're about to find out. And what's down on the middle of it is something so beautiful that takes thousands of years to make. A diamond down in the midst of all your hardship and all your pain. Yeah, something. Do you know what produces diamonds? There are three things that causes a diamond. Diamonds are down and, you know, they're the result of uh, three things that happen. Heat, over 2,000 degrees is what it takes to take what is just normal carbon and just normal substances in our, in our Earth's uh, core and cause that heat then compressed with all the pressure of all the rock and sediment around it and that heat and then over time what we get is a diamond. Can I tell you something? The pressure that you've been feeling, you say, I don't understand it. I thought by now God would have done this for me. I thought by now, I don't understand why God's got me doing this. I don't understand. I'm trying. I'm doing my best. I, and I don't understand why it's so hard. I don't understand why I've got so many layers. And, and sometimes I'll see you sometimes, guys. I'll, I'll look at you in worship, and I can just see you. You're like, man, so disappointed in where my life is ending up. Or I, I used to be so much more on fire for God when I was younger. Or, man, I just haven't become the man that I wanted to be or the woman I wanted to be. Frank, can I tell you something? All that pressure, all that difficulty, you don't realize. But inside of you is a diamond. Inside of you, God is doing something. Some, so, there is a jewel down. Because these, these little light and momentary afflictions, all these difficulties that you went through, they're just momentary. And they are producing for you an eternal glory. Something that is magnificent and wonderful. Can you imagine? Imagine year after year as that little Hebrew boy got down on his knees and he prayed to Jehovah. Can you imagine how angry he must have been at God? Why did you let this happen to me? Why did you give me dreams and visions of doing something great in my life? I, I'm, not even, I'm not even in that country anymore. I'm, not, I'm, I'm in some foreign country. I can never be I'm a slave at best. And then when he gets put in prison and all of the pressure to just live and to make it, there's no thriving. He's just trying not to kill himself. He's just trying not to live in depression every day because he can't walk outside and see the beautiful sunlight and they want to feel the beautiful breeze across his face how can there be a purpose and a calling of God in all of this Frank can I tell you when God has a plan for you when God has a destiny for you all pressure does is cause it to shine brighter all it does is cause it to become a beautiful piece a jewel inside of you who you are everything you've been through every hardship you've been through oh let me tell you something you cannot have a test testimony without a test. You can't overcome something unless you went through something. Are you there? You can't be called an overcomer until you've overcome. And we've got an entire generation. They just want to cut it short. I just don't want it. It's just so hard. I don't want my life to be perfect. I don't want to have any problems. Friend, can I tell you something? There is a pressure that comes because of God's plan on your life. There are difficulties that are the result that God has a plan for you. And as a result of that plan that he has for you, it can't help but have all of these other pieces build up around them so that God can in that encapsulation of difficulty, he can begin to formulate what is beautiful and from the earth, don't, don't you understand the way we get diamonds is because of eruptions from the earth volcanic eruptions, throw those things up from the depths of the, uh, uh, of the earth, some, some uh, 100 miles down and they throw them up and, and scatter them and men and women go and search for them and try to find them because they have been, they have been produced in fire they have been produced under pressure they have been produced over long hundreds and hundreds of years and it's in that it's in that guys that his plan to prosper you to propel you everybody wants it easy 
nobody wants to go through anything. And I understand, listen, I love to get around the older men and women of the faith. They don't preach as loud as they used to, and, and they don't ha always have the best memory anymore. But there's a depth to them. There's a beauty, because what they've been through has made them the men and women that we trust today, the heroes of the faith. Anybody can start the race who will finish the race. You know, the Apostle Paul is arguably one of the greatest figures in Scripture. He wrote two-thirds of our New Testament. Apostle Paul was, he healed the sick, he raised the dead, planted churches, defended the gospel, solidified most of our doctrine in a confusing time. When Apostle Paul gets saved, he is killing Christians, he is imprisoning Christians. He doesn't believe in Christianity. He thinks that it's a cult, and he's fighting against it. And when Jesus comes to him and basically knocks him on the ground on the road to Damascus, and he says, Paul, you're kicking against me. I'm the Savior. And so he decides, I will follow you. you I didn't realize. I'm so sorry. And the Lord speaks to Ananias, and he says to him, go and lay hands on Paul. He's got... He needs a healing. He's crying out for truth. And I says, I can't do that. He's the one who's killing all the Christians. And then God gives, a, gives Ananias a prophetic understanding of what Paul's life is to be. And I just want to read that out to you real quick. In Acts chapter 9, verse 15 through 16. He says, but the Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. Can you imagine? Wouldn't that be cool if God said, hey, guess what? I'm going to use you. You're going to preach the gospel to kings, to presidents. Wouldn't you be like, what? So what are you doing this week? Well, I'll just meet with Obama. She was, you know, praying with him about some things. You know, he's, he's almost at the place where he's going to make Jesus his Lord and Savior. I, prayed, I laid hands on the queen last week of England. She got baptized in the Holy Ghost and pretty good. I've got a couple, couple kings in Africa I'm going to interact with. It's, it's a good week. It's going to be a good week. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Those people be all over Daystar and TVN and we've been writing articles about them and they'd be on Jimmy Fallon late at night. So you pray for the president? I sure did. That's right. That's who I am. Adam McKay be here all night. You know, I mean, that, that would be the attitude. He's prophesied that he's going to bring Gentiles to salvation, which is something Israel hasn't been able to do. Hadn't wanted to do. And not only that, but he's going to stand in front of kings and preach the gospel. Woo! Who, who won't sign up for that calling? Now that, now that is worth living for, right? Yeah. And then let me continue on. He says in verse 16, and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. I will show him how much. Hey, Ananias, I'm going to put him in front of kings. This dude's special. This dude's got an anointing on his life. But buddy, let me tell you something. To get to that, the pressure that has to happen, the suffrage, the difficulty. Because see, can't, friends, listen to me. Difficulty is what propels you to destiny. Yeah, difficulty. Yeah. Everybody thinks it's anointing. It's not anointing. It's difficulty. Right. It propel, it's the fuel yeah. that propels you to destiny. Yeah. I'll illustrate that with my little rocket here. Uh, anybody ever do the little shoot the rockets up in the air thing? We went and bought one of these this week, so... You know, we're kind of on an um, illustrated sermon overload here. We're a little addicted this, this month. I don't know why. But the, the propulsion is, it's an air propulsion uh, uh, rocket. And, um, and so um, the goal is to see if we can get it, you know, how high you can get it. And so the pressure from the pump, as I pump it down, it'll pump that air through, and it, and it should, you know, shoot it up in the air. And, and they say these things will do about 1,000 feet. So let's see. I don't think we got our money's worth right there. Let me try that again. <laughs> Boy, did we get chipped on that one, huh? All right, let's try that one more time. All right, so, so maybe if I push a little harder, right? Because we need a lot more pressure, right, to get the height. All right, so let's push a little bit harder. Are you ready? Okay, let, let's, uh, I don't know. Let, you know what I need? I need something that will help us build up the pressure, encapsulate the pressure. Let me get one of these little pieces here. What it, so the way this rocket is made, actually, if I'll, if I'll just kind of open it up, and the place where the 
pressure can build up. And I'll put this one little stop piece. And this little stop piece, what it does is it allows for the air to actually build up. If I can get this one out. There we go. It allows for the air to be able to build up and then release. So that that air is in a compressed state. And then as it builds up and then it releases, it allows there to be propulsion. In fact, let's do it this way. Let me see if I can hit Sean in the forehead. And so, and so it's got to have a little bit more pressure. Oh, one, uh, two, a little bit more than the one before, huh? Three, how about this, four, wow, five. That was awesome. Good catch, dude. Sign him up for the Rangers, bro. Right? We tested that all this week, and it'll actually, it'll, it'll put a dent in the back wall, quite frankly, honestly. And, uh, but I angled it a little bit up because I was a little nervous it might chop some heads off. But for that to get any kind of distance, what did it have to have? Pressure. pressure. Why are you fighting against the pressure? It's going to propel you to greatness. The difficulties that you're going through. You say, oh, why is God allowing this to happen? Why isn't God for me? God is for you. He's with you. In fact, let me tell you something. When God allows us into the furnace, he controls the thermostat and he watches the temperature gauge. When he puts his kids in the furnace, he says, listen, I'm doing something so great in you. Don't worry about it, baby. I'm not going to let it get too hot, but I'm not going to let it get too cold either. And I'm watching your temperature. You're not going to burn out. You're not going to give up. You're not going to quit on me because I got you in the palm of my hand. But I've got to ignite something to get you moving forward. Things have to get under some pressure and some difficulty so that you can actually get to something. If you live the simple life where nothing ever happens and never difficulty and never comes to you, friend, what do you ever really accomplish? And friend, when you and I are in difficulty and you need to look up and go, wait a minute, maybe this is a part of God's plan for my life so that he can propel me to something magnificent and wonderful. Nobody wants to hear a story about somebody who never went through anything. Nobody's writing books about people who never accomplished anything. Nobody ever does an interview with somebody who didn't overcome something. You sit there and you watch all your little talk shows, and it's always about somebody, and then they did this to me, but I overcame, and then I went through this, but I overcame. And the reason that is is because the propelling of life is found in the difficulty of the circumstances that you and I look up and go, I don't want it, I don't like it, but friend, it's propelling me to greatness. So I will embrace it so that I can hit the mark because God has something big for me. I want to give you three things. Take these away. Here's our takeaways today, and then we'll We'll close out. Number one, three truths about God's pressure. Number one, it's making you great. God's pressure is making you great. Don't run from it. It's making you great. We don't believe in this church at all that God causes your children to die that God causes car accidents. That's not what I'm teaching you here. What I'm teaching you is that because there's a purpose on your life, there's pressure surrounding that purpose. And as a result of that, if you go and run away from it, instead of saying, you know what, I'm just going to stay here until God launches me. What, what, we don't, what I find people is people short circuit the pressure that's building up because they don't like it and they want to go run somewhere else. And that's why you've jumped from job to job to job to church to church to church to church. It's because the pressure builds up and you don't like it. You know, I don't, I don't want that. I don't like conflict. Oh, I don't like that nobody called me. Oh, I don't like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. They're doing the same thing at my job as they did at the last job. And because of that pressure, you run away from it. I'm telling you, embrace it. Embrace it because it's going to propel, overcome it because it's going to propel you to greatness. That's what I want you to understand. Here's the second truth, and that is this. This is all happening because he loves you. He loves you. He loves you. Can I tell you something about love? Some of us don't understand a father's love. But can I, I want to explain something to you. I whip my kids. Do you know I whip my kids? Number one, because the Bible tells me to. That's number one reason. Can I tell you the second reason I whip my kids? Because I'm looking at their future. And when they do that thing, I'm looking at their future. I'm not looking at them where they're at right now. I'm looking at their future. And I know that if that state, if that disobedience, see, see I, I said it like this first service. Let me say it to you like this. See, what is cute as a six-year-old becomes embarrassing when they're a 16-year-old. 
becomes deadly when they're a 26-year-old, and it's tragic when they're a 46-year-old, and it's just plumb shameful when they're a 66-year-old. But friend, I can't tell you how much counseling I've done with that fella who went home in a rage and beat his wife almost to death, and then come to find out when he was four years old, he had his little tantrum fits and nobody corrected him there either. And so that's why it's gone from this moment to this moment to this moment. And so when God loves us so much that he will cause those things in our life to come up so that he can deal with that and cut those things out because he's making something beautiful and what he'll do is he'll encapsulate you and he'll put you in an environment you hate in a church you don't even like sitting next to people in a small group that don't even have your same skin tone or even like what you like but he'll put you in that environment and he'll put pressure on you and he'll encapsulate you why because he's got a plan to propel you because he loves you that's why so he'll take you and he'll use the difficult things of life because he loves you. And the last piece that I want you to take away today, I pray in Jesus' name you really catch this, that greater the pressure means greater the distance propelled. He said, oh, pastor, oh, I just, I mean, oh, gosh, God's got me doing so much, man. I'm leading a small group. I'm serving in the kids' area. Sometimes I just, oh. It's just a lot. I would say to you, that's because he's going to propel you a lot further than you ever thought you could go. And these things are building. These momentary light afflictions are creating for you an eternal glory. When I tell you something, when Paul the apostle walks into heaven, he won't be carrying a gold medal from the Winter Olympics. When you and I walk into heaven, it won't matter how many doctor degrees we had on earth. Nobody's going to be impressed with any of that. When we get to heaven, the jewels around our neck, the tension that everyone in heaven will turn to will be the result of the pressure and the difficulties and the hardships that we said, I kept loving Jesus even when I was in Potiphar's house. I kept loving Jesus even when I was in jail. And when I got abandoned and forgotten about and mishandled and mistreated, God somehow encapsulated the truth of his love in me. And I never quit on him. And we walk around heaven we'll say, look, look. I don't know how he did it. I don't know how he did it. You want to see my diamond? I don't know how he did it, but he did it. I know it was hard, and I wanted to quit a lot on God, but he never left me. He never forsake me. He never, never let me out of the palm of his hand. Are you with me today? Say yes. I want you to stand with me quickly across the room. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes for just a moment. I want to minister to you just for a couple of minutes. With your head bowed and your eye closed, some of you are in this place today. We're finishing up this pressure series and you've been applying these truths each week. Okay, yeah, if I do this and if I'll do that, I won't have as much pressure at home. Oh, yeah, do that. Relieve the pressure at work. Oh, yeah, I'll be able to overcome the ducks of life. Yeah, 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 okay, I got that, Pastor. Thank you. There's a pressure I'm talking about today that you can't overcome. You just got to go through because it's going to develop in you the destiny of your life, the purpose, the jewel, a heavenly jewel. These momentary and light afflictions are producing for us a heavenly reward, a heavenly circumstance, a heavenly glory is the word that it uses something glorious that can't be taken from you that will be talked about throughout heaven a heavenly glory and as you stand there with your head bowed and your eye closed I want you just to take a second if you've been kicking against God's plan for your life if you gave up on it maybe you say you know pastor when I went to jail I thought that was it God could never use me again friend let me tell you something jail was just one another level and putting the pressure on the beauty of what you were becoming. You say, oh, when I went through that divorce, 
I just, I just thought it was all over. No, no, God's got that plan. Has never left you or forsaken you. He loves you. He's going to use you in ways that you never thought possible. What was happening inside of you? Oh, God has just made it so beautiful. As you stand there with your head bowed and your eye closed, I just want you to take a moment with the Lord and say, Lord, I'm here again. Just under your breath, Lord, I'm here again. I need you more than I've ever needed you. I want you just in this moment to embrace the plan of God for your life. I want you to embrace the plan and all the pressure and difficulty that comes with that. I want you to stop looking at the things in a wrong light. Maybe there have been some things you've been buying and causing, telling the devil to let go of it. And part of that was really God's plan working. And there is no binding the devil on it. It just has to be wrought in your life. It just has to happen. And I want you just to smile and say, God's good in the midst of whatever. Because I know that he's got a plan and a purpose. I want you to, for a moment, lay down all your fears and all your shamefulness. And just realize that God's producing in you a heavenly glory. Something inside of you is becoming like a beautiful diamond. Something you've been going through that's tried to cause you to think it wasn't God. God's working. He still loves you. He still got you. Now I want you to do me one more favor. I want you to reach over and grab the hand of that person next to you. And I want to pray for every man and woman in this room. I want you to pray for the person on either side of you. And I want you to ask the Lord. I want you to ask the Lord to give them understanding that he's not left them, he's not against them, that the pressure that they're feeling is actually producing for them a heavenly glory. Would you just pray that over them right now in Jesus' name? Father, I just thank you that every man and woman in this room will realize you're with them, you love them. That, Lord God, that you didn't abandon them. That, Lord God, no matter what they've been through, no matter what they've, what they've done, Lord God, you'll work that into this whole thing too because you've got a destiny. Lord God, you've got a plan. You're propelling them. Lord God, the pressure is building up, building up, building up, and they can feel it. They can sense it. They don't like it. But, Father, I thank you that pressure is good because you're going to propel them to everything you have for them. Father, I thank you right now in Jesus' name. No weapon formed against them will prosper. All those that rise up against them shall fall. And that every man and woman in this church, every man and woman visiting today will know that you love them and that you have a plan and a destiny and a reason that all of this is going to work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. And Father, I thank you even with blended families, oh God, even with things that they see is there's no way... Just it can, God can't use us like this. Father, I thank you. It can happen. It will happen because, Lord God, you are the king of glory. Nothing can stay your hand from accomplishing that which you want to accomplish. Now, if you'll just release those hands for a moment, I want to take just a couple minutes. If you're away from God today, you're not a Christian. You used to serve the Lord, but you're not serving him anymore. Or maybe you've never been a Christian, but you sense him tugging at your heart. You know that you don't want to live the rest of your life without a relationship with Jesus. I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about giving money to the church. I'm not talking about being good or bad. I'm talking about who do you know? See, when you're best friends with somebody, you start looking like them, acting like them, talking like them. I want to make you best friends with Jesus. I want to introduce you today. If you've been away from the Lord, I want to reintroduce you. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if I'm speaking to you today, say, Pastor, that's me. I'm not serving God, man. I'm not sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. Listen, don't leave like that. This is your moment. Let's respond with every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're away from God or you've never been a Christian, I want to pray with you. I want to introduce you to Jesus. You say, well, what do I have to do? Well, the Bible Bible says Jesus already did it. He died on a cross for our sins. He paid the penalty for our rebellion. All we do, the Bible says, is confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that he is the Christ, the son of the living God. He then will come and make his home in our hearts. His spirit will live and abide in us. He will mark us as his sons and daughters. And then you and I will grow in our relationship with him. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if this is you and you're ready to come back to Jesus, or you're tired of being away from him, or you've never been a Christian, you want me to pray with you. With no one looking around, would you lift your hand and say, that's me, and I'll pray with you right here and now. Say, Pastor, pray for me. God bless you. You can put your hand down. Who else? God bless you. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am, I see it. Yes, sir. Thank you, sweet love. Thank you, guys. God bless you. Put your hand down. I see it. Anybody else? You've got three more seconds. Thank you, sweet love. Thanks for your honesty. Just me, you, and Jesus right now responding to God. That's him tugging at your heart, not me. Pray for me, Pastor. I don't want to live like this anymore. I'm ready for a change. I'm going to make Jesus my Lord. Thank you, sweet love. God bless you. Thank you, sir. It's been many of you. Give you a couple more seconds. Anyone else? Thank you, son. God bless you. You can put your hand down. Amen. Thank you. I see it. Now, all your hands are down. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. 
those who lifted their hands, I just want you to repeat this prayer with me. I, I, but I want you to mean it. Let these be your words. You probably don't talk to Jesus a lot. So I want to introduce you to him through a prayer. In fact, I want everyone in the audience to pray this out loud with those who lifted their hands. Say it like this. Say, Jesus, today I give you my life. Today I declare Jesus is my Lord. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I'm ashamed of what I've become, how I've been living. But I ask you now, cleanse me, make me right. Here and now, you are mine and I am yours. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Write my name in your book of life. And I promise to serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. Keep your head bowed for just a moment. Father, I pray for every man and woman who lifted their hand, who made you their Lord right here, who prayed and repented of their sin. Lord, I pray right now they would grasp how much, how deep, how wide is your love for them. That, Lord, that there would be an understanding right now, like a blanket wrapped around them, that all the sin just dissipates. And, Lord, the love of their sin, the love of, the, of all the junk, Lord, they won't even like it anymore. And somehow they find themselves just like, I don't know, I want to go to church, I want to talk to God, I want to, I want to interact with Him at home, I want to go to small group. Father, I just pray right now that they would sense forever forgiveness on their life in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.